After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, Who of us is to go up first to fight against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah shall go up. I have given the land into their hands. The men of Judah then said to the Simeonites, their fellow Israelites, Come up with us into the territory allotted to us to fight against the Canaanites. We in turn will go with you into yours. So the Simeonites went with them. When Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and Perizzites into their hands, and they struck down 10,000 men at Bezek. It was there that they found Adonai Bezek and fought against him, putting to rout the Canaanites and Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they chased him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Then Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. The men of Judah attacked Jerusalem also and took it. They put the city to the sword and set it on fire. After that, Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills. They advanced against the Canaanites living in Hebron, formerly called Kiriath Arba, and defeated Shishai, Ahiman, and Telmai. From there they advanced against the people living in Debir, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, so Caleb gave his daughter Aksa to him in marriage. One day, when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, What can I do for you? She replied, Do me a special favor. Since you have given me land in the Negev, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. The descendants of Moses' father-in-law, the Kenite, went up from the city of Palms with the people of Judah to live among the inhabitants of the desert of Judah in the Negev near Arad. Then the men of Judah went with the Simeonites, their fellow Israelites, and attacked the Canaanites living in Zephat and totally destroyed the city. Therefore it was called Hormah. Judah also took Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron, each city with its territory. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron. As Moses had promised, Hebron was given to Caleb, who drove from it the three sons of Anak. The Benjamites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites lived there with the Benjamites. Now the tribes of Joseph attacked Bethel, and the Lord was with them. When they sent men to spy out Bethel, formerly called Luz, the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Show us how to get into the city, and we will see that you are treated well. So he showed them, and they put the city to the sword, but spared the man and his whole family. He then went to the land of the Hittites, where he built a city and called it Luz, which is its name to this day. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth Shan, or Tanakh, or Dor, or Ibliam, or Megiddo, and their surrounding settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, but the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nehalal. So these Canaanites lived among them, but Zebulon did subject them to forced labor. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon or Alab or Akzib or Helba or Aphek or Rehob. The Asherites lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land because they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath, but the Naphtalites too lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land, and those living in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became forced laborers for them. The Amorites confined the Danites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain. And the Amorites were determined also to hold out Mount Heres, Aijalon, and Shalbim. But when the power of the tribes of Joseph increased, they too were pressed into forced labor. The boundary of the Amorites was from Scorpion Pass to Sela and beyond. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called the place Bochim. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. 
The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at timnath Hedis in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors, who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, Because this nation has violated the covenant I ordained for their ancestors and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. The Lord had allowed these nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebal Hamat. They were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given their ancestors through Moses. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishatim, king of Aram Naharaim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rishatim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for forty years, until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. Again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for eighteen years. Again the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us, and they all left. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade, and his bowels discharged. Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch, he shut the doors of the upper room behind him, and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said, He must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There they saw their lord fall into the floor, dead. While they waited, Ehud got away, 
he passed by the stone images and escaped to Sirah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harosheth Hagoyim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go, but if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah, but because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and ten thousand men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zaananim, near Kadesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Herosheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go! This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Herosheth Hagoyim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please, give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone in there, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. Just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin king of Canaan before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin king of Canaan until they destroyed him. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. The princes in Israel take the lead when the people will be offer themselves. Praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings, listen, you rulers. I even I. Sing to the Lord, I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. When you, Lord, went out from Seth, Pour the clouds, pour down water, 
Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If I now have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, 
Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Oprah of the A.B. Ezraites. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar, demolished, with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, Who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, Bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's case? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerob Baal that day, saying, Let Baal contend with him. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abiezrites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet them. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, Look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. Early in the morning, Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the three hundred men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the three hundred who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you were afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Purah and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outpost of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. 
Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them, with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the three hundred trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth Shitta towards Zirara, as far as the border of Abel Meholah near Tibet. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh were called out, and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they seized the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Barah. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. But he answered them, What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest at Abiezer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subsided. Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. He said to the men of Sukkoth, Give my troops some bread. They are worn out, and I am still pursuing Zeba and Zalmanna, the kings of Midian. But the officials of Sukkoth said, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmanna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your troops? Then Gideon replied, Just for that, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, I will tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. From there he went up to Peniel and made the same request of them, but they answered as the man of Sukkoth had. So he said to the men of Peniel, When I return in triumph, I will tear down this tower. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor with a force of about 15,000 men, all that were left of the armies of the eastern people. A hundred and twenty thousand swordsmen had fallen. Gideon went up by the route of the nomads east of Nobah and Jogbaha and attacked the unsuspecting army. Zeba and Zalmunna, the two kings of Midian, fled, but he pursued them and captured them, routing their entire army. Gideon, son of Joash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Heres. He caught a young man of Sukkoth and questioned him, and the young man wrote down for him the names of the seventy-seven officials of Sukkoth, the elders of the town. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Sukkoth, Here are Zeba and Zalmanna, about whom you taunted me by saying, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give you bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Sukkoth a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. Then he asked Zeba and Zalmunna, What kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Men like you, they answered, each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, Those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, Kill them! But Jether did not draw his sword, because he was only a boy and was afraid. Zeba and Zalmunna said, Come do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them, and took the ornaments off their camels' necks. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, We'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on their camels' necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshipping it there. 
and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace 40 years. Jeroboam, son of Joash, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal-berit as their god and did not remember the Lord their god, who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. Abimelech, son of Jerubbaal, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them and to all his mother's clan, Ask all the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you? To have all seventy of Jeroboam's sons rule over you, or just one man? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. When the brothers repeated all this to the citizens of Shechem, they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is related to us. They gave him seventy shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berit, and Abimelech used it to hire reckless scoundrels, who became his followers. He went to his father's home in Ophrah, and on one stone murdered his seventy brothers, the sons of Jeroboam. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, escaped by hiding. Then all the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered around the great tree at the pillar of Shechem to crown Abimelech king. When Jotham was told about this, he climbed up on top of Mount Gerizim and shouted to them, Listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. One day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. They said to the olive tree, Be our king. But the olive tree answered, should I give up my oil, by which both gods and humans are honored, to hold sway over the trees? Next, the tree said to the fig tree, Come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, Should I give up my fruit, so good and sweet, to hold sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the vine, Come and be our king. But the vine answered, Should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and humans, to hold sway over the trees? Finally, all the trees said to the thorn bush, Come and be our king. The thorn bush said to the trees, If you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Have you acted honorably and in good faith by making Abimelech king? Have you been fair to Jeroboam and his family? Have you treated him as he deserves? Remember that my father fought for you and risked his life to rescue you from the hand of Midian. But today, you have revolted against my father's family. You have murdered his seventy sons on a single stone and have made Abimelech, the son of his female slave, king over the citizens of Shechem because he is related to you. So have you acted honorably and in good faith toward Jeroboam and his family today? If you have, may Abimelech be your joy and may you be his too. But if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. Then Jotham fled, escaping to Beer, and he lived there because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. After Abimelech had governed Israel three years, God stirred up animosity between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem, so that they acted treacherously against Abimelech. God did this in order that the crime against Jeroboam's seventy sons, the shedding of their blood, might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and on the citizens of Shechem, who had helped him murder his brothers. In opposition to him, these citizens of Shechem set men on the hilltops to ambush and rob everyone who passed by, and this was reported to Abimelech. Now Gaul, son of Ebed, moved with his clan into Shechem, and its citizens put their confidence in him. After they had gone out into the fields and gathered the grapes and trodden them, they held a festival in the temple of their god. While they were eating and drinking, they cursed Abimelech. Then Gaul, son of Ebed, said, Who is this Abimelech, and why should we Shechemites be subject to him? Isn't he Jeroboam's son, and isn't Zebal his deputy? Serve the family of Hamor, Shechem's father. Why would we serve Abimelech? If only this people were under my command, then I would get rid of him. I would say to Abimelech, Call out your whole army.
When Zebal, the governor of the city, heard what Gaul, son of Ebed, said, he was angry. Under cover, he sent messengers to Abimelech, saying, Gaul, son of Ebed, and his clan have come to Shechem and are stirring up the city against you. Now then, during the night, you and your men should come and lie in wait in the fields. In the morning, at sunrise, advance against the city. When Gaul and his men come out against you, seize the opportunity to attack them. So Abimelech and all his troops set out by night and took up concealed positions near Shechem in four companies. Now Gaul, son of Ebed, had gone out and was standing at the entrance of the city gate, just as Abimelech and his troops came out from their hiding place. When Gaul saw them, he said to Zebal, Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. Zebal replied, You mistake the shadows of the mountains for men. But Gaul spoke up again, Look, people are coming down from the central hill, and a company is coming from the direction of the diviner's tree. Then Zebal said to him, Where is your big talk now, you who said, Who is Abimelech that we should be subject to him? Aren't these the men you ridiculed? Go out and fight them. So Gaul led out the citizens of Shechem and fought Abimelech. Abimelech chased him all the way to the entrance of the gate, and many were killed as they fled. Then Abimelech stayed in Aromah, and Zebal drove Gal and his clan out of Shechem. The next day the people of Shechem went out to the fields, and this was reported to Abimelech. So he took his men, divided them into three companies, and set an ambush in the fields. When he saw the people coming out of the city, he rose to attack them. Abimelech and the companies with him rushed forward to a position at the entrance of the city gate. Then two companies attacked those in the fields and struck them down. All that day Abimelech pressed his attack against the city until he had captured it and killed its people. Then he destroyed the city and scattered salt all over it. On hearing this, the citizens in the tower of Shechem went into the stronghold of the temple of El Berit. When Abimelech heard that they had assembled there, he and all his men went up Mount Zalman. He took an axe and cut off some branches, which he lifted to his shoulders. He ordered the men with him, Quick! Do what you have seen me do! So all the men cut branches and followed Abimelech. They piled them against the stronghold and set it on fire with the people still inside. So all the people in the Tower of Shechem, about a thousand men and women, also died. Next, Abimelech went to Tabez and besieged it and captured it. Inside the city, however, was a strong tower to which all the men and women, all the people of the city had fled. They had locked themselves in and climbed up on the tower roof. Abimelech went to the tower and attacked it, but as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire, a woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull. Hurriedly, he called to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and kill me, so they can't say a woman killed him. So his servant ran him through, and he died. When the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. Thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his seventy brothers. God also made the people of Shechem pay for all their wickedness. The curse of Jotham, son of Jeroboam, came on them. After the time of Abimelech, a man of Issachar named Tola, son of Puah, the son of Dodo, rose to save Israel. He lived in Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. He led Israel 23 years, then he died and he was buried in Shamir. He was followed by Jair of Gilead, who led Israel 22 years. He had 30 sons, who rode 30 donkeys. They controlled 30 towns in Gilead, which to this day are called Havoth Jair. When Jair died, he was buried in Cainon. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord, no longer served him, he became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. For eighteen years they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan and Gilead, the land of the Amorites. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. Israel was in great distress. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, We have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. The Lord replied, when the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites oppressed you, and you cried to me for help, did I not save you from their hands? But you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. But the Israelites said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord and he could bear Israel's misery no longer. 
when the Ammonites were called to arms and camped in Gilead, the Israelites assembled and camped in Mizpah. The leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, Whoever will take the lead in attacking the Ammonites will be head over all who live in Gilead. Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead, his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander, so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, Didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now, when you are in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites, and you will be head over all of us who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, The Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, What do you have against me that you have attacked my country? The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah's messengers, When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok, all the way to the Jordan. Now give it back peaceably. Jephthah sent back messengers to the Ammonite king, saying, This is what Jephthah says. Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up out of Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and on to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Give us permission to go through your country. But the king of Edom would not listen. They sent also to the king of Moab, and he refused. So Israel stayed at Kadesh. Next they traveled through the wilderness, skirted the lands of Edom and Moab, passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab, and camped on the other side of the Arnon. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was its border. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon, and said to him, Let us pass through your country to our own place. Sihon, however, did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his troops and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and his whole army into Israel's hands, and they defeated them. Israel took over all the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. Now, since the Lord, the God of Israel, has driven the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Will you not take what your god Chemosh gives you? Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. Are you any better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years Israel occupied Heshbon, Aror, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? I have not wronged you, but you are doing me wrong by waging war against me. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated twenty towns from Aror to the vicinity of Mineth, as far as abel Karamim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was only a child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I will never marry. 
You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. The Ephraimite forces were called out, and they crossed over to Zephon. They said to Jephthah, Why did you go fight the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We're going to burn down your house over your head. Jephthah answered, I and my people were engaged in a great struggle with the Ammonites, and although I called you, you didn't save me out of their hands. When I saw that you wouldn't help, I took my life in my hands and crossed over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave me the victory over them. Now why have you come up today to fight me? Jephthah then called together the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. The Gileadites struck them down because the Ephraimites had said, You Gileadites are renegades from Ephraim and Manasseh. The Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan leading to Ephraim, and whenever a survivor of Ephraim said, Let me cross over, the men of Gilead asked him, Are you an Ephraimite? If he replied no, they said, All right, say Shibboleth. If he said Sibboleth because he could not pronounce the word correctly, they seized him and killed him at the fords of the Jordan. 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. Jephthah led Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in a town in Gilead. After him, Ibzan of Bethlehem led Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave his daughters away in marriage to those outside his clan, and for his sons he brought in 30 young women as wives from outside his clan. Ibzan led Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried in Bethlehem. After him, Elon the Zebulite led Israel ten years. Then Elon died and was buried in Ajlon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon, son of Hillel from Pirathon, led Israel. He had forty sons and thirty grandsons, who rode on seventy donkeys. He led Israel eight years. Then Abdon, son of Hillel, died and was buried in Pirathon in Ephraim, in the hill country of the Amalekites. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for forty years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You will become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, He's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, Are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, What is your name, so that we may honor you when your word comes true? He replied, Why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat, together with the grain offering, and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. 
As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, If the Lord meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things or now told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahanadan, between Zorah and Eshtaol. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards in Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands, as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked to the woman, and he liked her. Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Now his father went down to see the woman, and there Samson held a feast, as was customary for young men. When the people saw him, they chose thirty men to be his companions. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me thirty linen garments and thirty sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. He replied, Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days they could not give the answer. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, Coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to steal our property? Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, You hate me! You don't really love me! You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer! I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, he replied, so why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast, so on the seventh day he finally told her, because she continued to press him. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down thirty of their men, stripped them of everything, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home, and Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. Later on, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father would not let him go in. I was so sure you hated her, he said, that I gave her to your companion. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Samson said to them, This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught three hundred foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches, and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. When the Philistines asked, Who did this? They were told, Samson, the Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his companion. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Samson said to them, Since you've acted like this, I swear that I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave at the rock of Etam. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The people of Judah asked, Why have you come to fight us? We have come to take Samson prisoner, they answered, to do to him as he did to us. 
Then three thousand men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, We've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, Swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him, shouting. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, With a donkey's jawbone I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone I have killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramoth Lehi. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. So the spring was called en Hakor, and it is still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for twenty years in the days of the Philistines. One day Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here! So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, At dawn, we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him, so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then, with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you! But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, All this time you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, If you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with the pin. Again she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you! He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin in the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such a nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, Come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you! He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to celebrate, saying, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. 
When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us! So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me? Please God, strengthen me just once more, and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood. Bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other, Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. Then they brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel twenty years. Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from you, and about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. Then his mother said, The Lord bless you, my son. When he returned the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make an image overlaid with silver. I will give it back to you. So after he returned the silver to his mother, she took two hundred shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith, who used them to make an idol, and it was put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and some household gods, and installed one of his sons as his priest. In those days Israel had no king, everyone did as they saw fit. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who had been living within the clan of Judah, left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, Where are you from? I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, he said, and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, Live with me and be my father and priest, and I'll give you ten shekels of silver a year, your clothes and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. Then Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me, since this Levite has become my priest. In those days Israel had no king. And in those days the tribe of the Danites was seeking a place of their own where they might settle, because they had not yet come into an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. So the Danites sent five of their leading men from Zerah and Eshtaol to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all the Danites. They told them, Go, explore the land! So they entered the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah, where they spent the night. When they were near Micah's house, they recognized the voice of a young Levite. So they turned in there and asked him, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them what Micah had done for him, and he said, He has hired me, and I am his priest. Then they said to him, Please, inquire of God to learn whether our journey will be successful. The priest answered them, Go in peace. Your journey has the Lord's approval. So the five men left and came to Laish, where they saw that the people were living in safety, like the Sidonians, at peace and secure. And since their land lacked nothing, they were prosperous. Also, they lived a long way from the Sidonians and had no relationship with anyone else. When they returned to Zorah and Eshtaol, their fellow Danites asked them, How did you find things? They answered, Come on, let's attack them. We have seen the land and it is very good. Aren't you going to do something? Don't hesitate to go there and take it over. When you get there, you will find an unsuspecting people in a spacious land that God has put into your hands, a land that lacks nothing whatever. Then six hundred men of the Danites, armed for battle, set out from Zorah and Eshtaol. On their way, they set up camp near Kiriath-Jarim in Judah. This is why the place west of Kiriath-Jarim is called Mahana Dan to this day. From there they went to the hill country of Ephraim and came to Micah's house. Then the five men who spied out the land of Laish said to their fellow Danites, Do you know that one of these houses has an ephod, some household gods, and an image overlaid with silver? Now you know what to do. 
So they turned in there and went to the house of the young Levite at Micah's place and greeted him. The 600 Danites, armed for battle, stood at the entrance of the gate. The five men who spied out the land went inside and took the idol, the ephod, and the household gods, while the priest and the 600 armed men stood at the entrance of the gate. When the five men went into Micah's house and took the idol, the ephod, and the household gods, the priest said to them, What are you doing? They answered him, Be quiet. Don't say a word. Come with us and be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and clan in Israel as priest rather than just one man's household? The priest was very pleased. He took the ephod, the household gods, and the idol and went along with the people. Putting their little children, their livestock, and their possessions in front of them, they turned away and left. When they had gone some distance from Micah's house, the men who lived near Micah were called together and overtook the Danites. As they shouted after them, the Danites turned and said to Micah, What's the matter with you that you called out your men to fight? He replied, You took the gods I made and my priest and went away. What else do I have? How can you ask what's the matter with you? The Danites answered, Don't argue with us, or some of the men may get angry and attack you, and you and your family will lose your lives. So the Danites went their way, and Micah, seeing that they were too strong for him, turned around and went back home. Then they took what Micah had made, and his priest, and went on to Laish, against a people at peace and secure. They attacked them with the sword and burned down their city. There was no one to rescue them because they lived a long way from Sidon and had no relationship with anyone else. The city was in a valley near Beth Rehob. The Danites rebuilt the city and settled there. They named it Dan after their ancestor Dan, who was born to Israel, though the city used to be called Laish. There the Danites set up for themselves the idol, and Jonathan son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. They continued to use the idol Micah had made, all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. In those days, Israel had no king. Now a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But she was unfaithful to him. She left him and went back to her parents' home in Bethlehem, Judah. After she had been there four months, her husband went to her to persuade her to return. He had with him his servant and two donkeys. She took him into her parents' home, and when her father saw him, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the woman's father, prevailed on him to stay. So he remained with him three days, eating and drinking and sleeping there. On the fourth day they got up early and he prepared to leave, but the woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh yourself with something to eat, then you can go. So the two of them sat down to eat and drink together. Afterward the woman's father said, Please, stay tonight and enjoy yourself. And when the man got up to go, his father-in-law persuaded him, so he stayed there that night. On the morning of the fifth day when he rose to go, the woman's father said, Refresh yourself, wait till afternoon. So the two of them ate together. Then when the man, with his concubine and his servant, got up to leave, his father-in-law, the woman's father, said, Now look, it's almost evening. Spend the night here. The day is nearly over. Stay and enjoy yourself. Early tomorrow morning you can get up and be on your way home. But unwilling to stay another night, the man left and went towards Jebus, that is Jerusalem, with his two saddled donkeys and his concubine. When they were near Jebus and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, Come. Let's stop at this city of the Jebusites and spend the night. His master replied, No, we won't go into any city whose people are not Israelites. We will go on to Gibeah. He added, Come, let's try to reach Gibeah or Ramah and spend the night in one of those places. So they went on, and the sun set as they neared Gibeah in Benjamin. There they stopped to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them in for the night. That evening, an old man from the hill country of Ephraim, who was living in Gibeah, the inhabitants of the place were Benjamites, came in from his work in the fields. When he looked and saw the traveler in the city square, the old man asked, Where are you going? Where do you come from? He answered, We are on our way from Bethlehem in Judah to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim where I live. I have been to Bethlehem in Judah, and now I am going to the house of the Lord. No one has taken me in for the night. We have both straw and fodder for our donkey, and bread and wine for ourselves, your servants, me, the woman, and the young man with us. We don't need anything. You are welcome at my house, the old man said. Let me supply whatever you need. Only, don't spend the night in the square. So he took him into his house and fed his donkeys. After they had washed their feet, they had something to eat and drink. 
While they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house, pounding on the door. They shouted to the old man who owned the house, Bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him! The owner of the house went outside and said to them, No, my friends, don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this outrageous thing. Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I will bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. But as for this man, don't do such an outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man took his concubine and sent her outside to them, and they raped her and abused her throughout the night. And at dawn they let her go. At daybreak the woman went back to the house where her master was staying, fell down at the door and lay there until daylight. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door to the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get up, let's go. But there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine, limb by limb, into twelve parts and sent them into all the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, Such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Just imagine! We must do something, so speak up. Then all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead, came together as one and assembled before the Lord in Mizpah. The leaders of all the people of the tribes of Israel took their places in the assembly of God's people, 400,000 men armed with swords. The Benjamites heard that the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. Then the Israelites said, Tell us how this awful thing happened. So the Levite, the husband of the murdered woman, said, I and my concubine came to Gibeah and Benjamin to spend the night. During the night, the men of Gibeah came after me and surrounded the house, intending to kill me. They raped my concubine and she died. I took my concubine, cut her into pieces, and sent one piece to each region of Israel's inheritance, because they committed this lewd and outrageous act in Israel. Now. All you Israelites, speak up and tell me what you have decided to do. All the men rose up together as one, saying, None of us will go home. No, not one of us will return to his house. But now, this is what we'll do to Gibeah. We'll go up against it in the order decided by casting lots. We'll take ten men out of every hundred from all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred from a thousand, and a thousand from ten thousand, to get provisions for the army. Then, when the army arrives at Gibeah and Benjamin, it can give them what they deserve for this outrageous act done in Israel. So all the Israelites got together and united as one against the city. The tribes of Israel sent messengers throughout the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What about this awful crime that was committed among you? Now turn those wicked men of Gibeah over to us so that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From their towns they came together at Gibeah to fight against the Israelites. At once the Benjamins mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their towns, in addition to 700 able young men from those living in Gibeah. Among all these soldiers there were 700 select troops who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen, all of them fit for battle. The Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God. They said, Who of us is to go up first to fight against the Benjamites? The Lord replied, Judah shall go first. The next morning the Israelites got up and pitched camp near Gibeah. The Israelites went out to fight the Benjamites and took up battle positions against them at Gibeah. The Benjamites came out of Gibeah and cut down 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. But the Israelites encouraged one another and again took up their positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening, and they inquired of the Lord. They said, Shall we go up again to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites? The Lord answered, Go up against them. Then the Israelites drew near to Benjamin the second day. This time, when the Benjamites came out from Gibeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18,000 Israelites, all of them armed with swords. Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until the evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord, 
In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there, with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. They asked, Shall we go up again to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites, or not? The Lord responded, Go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. Then Israel set an ambush around Gibeah. They went up against the Benjamites on the third day and took up positions against Gibeah as they had done before. The Benjamites came out to meet them and were drawn away from the city. They began to inflict casualties on the Israelites as before, so that about 30 men fell in the open field and on the roads, the one leading to Bethel and the other to Gibeah. While the Benjamites were saying, We are defeating them as before! The Israelites were saying, Let's retreat and draw them away from the city to the roads! All of the men of Israel moved from their places and took up positions in Baal Tamar, and the Israelite ambush charged out of its place on the west of Gibeah. Then 10,000 of Israel's able young men made a frontal attack on Gibeah. The fighting was so heavy that the Benjamites did not realize how near disaster was. The Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel, and on that day the Israelites struck down 25,100 Benjamites, all armed with swords. Then the Benjamites saw that they were beaten. Now the men of Israel had given way before Benjamin because they relied on the ambush they had set near Gibeah. Those who had been in ambush made a sudden dash into Gibeah, spread out and put the whole city to the sword. The Israelites had arranged with the ambush that they should send up a great cloud of smoke from the city, and then the Israelites would counterattack. The Benjamites had begun to inflict casualties on the Israelites, about 30, and they said, We are defeating them, as in the first battle! But when the column of smoke began to rise from the city, the Benjamites turned and saw the whole city going up in smoke. Then the Israelites counterattacked, and the Benjamites were terrified because they realized that disaster had come on them. So they fled before the Israelites in the direction of the wilderness, but they could not escape the battle, and the Israelites who came out of the towns cut them down there. They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, and easily overran them in the vicinity of Gibeah on the east. 18,000 Benjamites fell, all of them valiant fighters. As they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimon, the Israelites cut down 5,000 men along the roads. They kept pressing after the Benjamites as far as Gidom and struck down 2,000 more. On that day, 25,000 Benjamite swordsmen fell, all of them valiant fighters. But 600 of them turned and fled into the wilderness to the rock of Rimmon, where they stayed four months. The men of Israel went back to Benjamin and put all the towns to the sword, including the animals and everything else they found. All the towns they came across, they set on fire. The men of Israel had taken an oath at Mizpah, Not one of us will give his daughter in marriage to a Benjamite. The people went to Bethel, where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and weeping bitterly. Lord, God of Israel, they cried, why has this happened to Israel? Why should one tribe be missing from Israel today? Early the next morning, the people built an altar and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Israelites asked, Who from all the tribes of Israel has failed to assemble before the Lord? For they had taken a solemn oath that anyone who failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah was to be put to death. Now the Israelites grieved for the tribe of Benjamin, their fellow Israelites. Today one tribe is cut off from Israel, they said. How could we provide wives for those who are left, since we have taken an oath by the Lord not to give them any of our daughters in marriage? Then they asked, Which one of the tribes of Israel failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah? They discovered that no one from Jabesh Gilead had come to the camp for the assembly. For when they counted the people, they found that none of the people of Jabesh Gilead were there. So the assembly sent 12,000 fighting men with instructions to go to Jabesh Gilead and put to the sword those living there, including the women and children. This is what you are to do, they said. Kill every male and every woman who is not a virgin. They found among the people living in Jabesh Gilead 400 young women who had never slept with a man, and they took them to the camp at Shiloh in Canaan. Then the whole assembly sent an offer of peace to the Benjamites at the Rock of Rimmon. So the Benjamites returned at that time and were given the women of Jabesh Gilead who had been spared, but there were not enough for all of them. The people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a gap in the tribes of Israel, and the elders of the assembly said, But the women of Benjamin destroyed. How shall we provide wives for the men who are left? The Benjamite survivors must have heirs, they said, so that a tribe of Israel will not be wiped out. We can't give them our daughters as wives, since we Israelites have taken this oath. Cursed be anyone who gives a wife to a Benjamite. But look, 
There is an annual festival of the Lord in Shiloh, which lies north of Bethel, east of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem, and south of Lebanon. So they instructed the Benjamites, saying, Go, and hide in the vineyards and watch. When the young women of Shiloh come out to join in the dancing, rush from the vineyards, and each of you sees one of them to be your wife. Then return to the land of Benjamin. When their fathers or brothers complain to us, we will say to them, Do us the favor of helping them, because we did not get wives for them during the war. You will not be guilty of breaking your oath, because you did not give your daughters to them. So that is what the Benjamites did. While the young women were dancing, each man caught one and carried her off to be his wife. Then they returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the towns and settled in them. At that time, the Israelites left that place and went home to their tribes and clans, each to his own inheritance. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit.